beautiful thing I've ever seen. You know, it, it kept it all nice and clean. And I actually have the guitar. It is a very humble guitar and it's a gut string. Of course, he had steel strings on it. And so I couldn't really play it that well. Um, all I wanted to say about this, that was when you sing over a D28 and you really stroke the guitar so that the full voice comes out, it will, you, you have to uh, adjust your singing to, to that. Mm -hmm. And then I think also, you know, playing rock and roll dances as a 14 year old probably, <laughs> you know, you had to sing, you know. <laughs> and uh, with Bill Monroe, he did talk about his whole uh, approach, you know, uh, because he had a, you know, he had a, a a false falsetto, you know, where he would sing, you know, a real falsetto was, you know, you know, but Bill had a, he had a thing where he had uh, expanded his range and uh, he told me that singing behind a mule, plowing, his, you know, his actual words were, it's in my book, but I'll... But he said, you know, many a times I'd be singing behind a mule out plowing there in the hills of Rosine, wondering where my brothers was. They had, uh, you know, they were older than him and he, they had gone off to work, uh, as many people from Kentucky, uh, uh, Appalachia had, gone to Chicago and places like that. And that's where Bill first went. It was, he was a dancer on the WLS barn dance. That was his first gig, was a dancer. <laughs> and uh, and I, I would, went to square dances as a 12 year old on through, you know, until I think I heard little Richard scream, womp, bom, ba, doo, bom, ba, lom, bam, boom. And I went, hmm, <laughs> what kind of dance is that? <laughs> um, but the, when, by Bill saying that, it's a whole it's a whole story because the related stories to him being out in a field he said I would that's where I, I said well where did you practice you know and he never told me though that or I think he finally told me in, uh, over years that they had a uh, choir master come to Kentucky and if you've heard Bill Monroe's gospel songs they seem so perfectly formed uh, but it was, they had like a traveling itinerant, you know, uh, choir master come through Kentucky when he was a kid. And he would lead everybody on the Sunday mornings and he taught everybody how to sing parts, probably shape note parts. So Bill had training. He wasn't just sort of, you know, he, as he would say, I studied on it. <laughs> I studied on it. And uh, so the, this whole thing about being out in that, be, between the hills, you know, plowing and where the, where the soil would be good, probably has a lot to do with when his parents had died and he was old enough, he, he, I think he was eight years old when he went to live with his uncle Penn and was exposed to Arnold Schultz, the black guitarist from New Orleans. But along the, the lines of that same uh, imagery of Bill out there in the fields, he said, he said now, I would, I would learn to throw my voice out there, uh, just singing behind, plowing behind a mule. He said, and in the evening when work was done, you would hear people calling from all the hollers in the hills, and they would whoop. And we had that as kids, you know. Su supper time was something like woo. -hoo! You know, my mother would sing out the back porch and they'd call you home for supper. And I thought that was, I mean, everybody had their own call. And, and for Bill to relate that to me was like, it was, it was t very touching, you know. You'd hear, oh, well, that's old James from that part of the holler down there, you know, woo hoo, you know, everybody had a call. So Bill was in that world, you know, where people in the country communicated by, calling Woo! you know I'm sure everybody here has had some of that you know as especially as a kid right you know but you were 
You were like up by Boston, right? Well, we were out in the country from Boston. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty country at the time. When did you start singing? Well, the earliest, <laughs> there were two things. Uh, one is the Christmas caroling. And, and we went to church, you know. I did anyway. My brothers, by then my parents had sort of, they'd gotten all the religion they needed, I guess. But um, I, I was brought up, it, I was the eldest, so I got all the, everything was tried out on me, put it that way. <laughs> You're taking Holy Communion. What? <laughs> You're being baptized, huh? <laughs> so we sang in church, but I wasn't in a church choir. Uh, but I do remember how, man, everybody knows these songs, you know, they, everybody had a hymn and uh, But really it was the Christmas caroling uh, in those days. And strangely enough, this year especially, Massachusetts had a lot of snow just in the years of, you know, in the weather patterns of my youth, there was a lot of snow and it was a big, deal for us kids to go out and tunnel and everything and and when you're small you know the snow's up to your chest you know and so uh, so Christmas caroling was always very special in the earliest times that where the neighbors would come by and sing you know right up on the porch uh, I would be in my pajamas you know and I would be hanging back and listening you know and then you you get to be a certain age and you get, get to go Christmas caroling. And so the, all these songs kind of seep into your your mind. You know, my, my aunt was a, you know, a, what is it? Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. And she would lead, uh, and the sun, da, 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 da. Da, 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 and hit the chorus, of course. If you didn't know the verses, boy, you could sing the choruses. <laughs> Gloria in excelsis Deo. Then my aunt, which had hit the high soprano part, <laughs> you know, and it was like, made, made your chill, bond, chill come up in your back. <laughs> And you know, it, it, it was all very communal, you know, invitational. You know, there was no, uh, you, nobody ever told you not to join in, you know. Did you and your brothers try to sing harmony oh, early yeah. on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's where it all came from. They all had Did you sing late because you were the oldest? Well, so, yeah, jump forward to being 14 years old, we're out around Boston, Massachusetts, with the drummer had his license, so we were out there driving around with, you know, we're just teenagers. And my brothers were younger and uh, once I, I mean, the radio was everything, uh, you know, uh, people wanted to dance, that's the thing. And this was, a, had not had happened in our generation. And my mother said, oh yeah, yeah Fats Domino, Fats Waller, you know, that's all the same, I suppose. You know, but then she accused me of trying to imitate Elvis Presley. She says, you're sticking your lips out. No, I'm not. I mean, they, they were, Elvis shook the world up for them, you know. They had been through World War II when they were children in the Great Depression. So, but my, yeah, so I began to learn uh, songs in the folk music tradition. Uh, especially bluegrass, because the harmonies. I mean, okay, here's, I started out listening to, there was a guy named uh, Lonnie Donegan. <laughs> well, the Rock Island Line is a mighty good line. The Rock Island Line is a road to ride. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good line. Well, if you want to ride it, go to ride it like you find it by your ticket at the station. The Rock Island Line. But who wrote that? Lead Belly. Oh, wow. So Lead Belly became my thing, and I learned, uh, yeah, black girl, black girl, don't lie to me. 
Tell me where did you sleep last night? So then I heard, you know, the longest train I ever saw went down the Georgia line. Same song, and uh, but that was Bill Monroe's version. In the first record I heard of Bill Monroe, Clyde Moody was playing guitar. He was playing. Six white horses going two by two. Six white horses going two by two. I got another woman. Another man got you. So that's, I sort of absorbed the blues, but I didn't, it's weird now, this is not a racial thing, but I just didn't feel culturally, I felt it was way beyond me to really be a blues man. But I met Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, and I learned from uh, Brownie, and the other person I learned from was Josh White. You know, uh, I've got the key to the highway. Well, that's where I'm bound. I got to leave here running. Walking as much too slow. Right, the same lick. A wonderful E chord. Thompson guitar, by the way. <laughs> Can I have it? <laughs> um, I think so. <laughs> oh man, yeah, no, Preston. Uh, yeah. Preston, has, his legacy is, is wonderful. They're doing right by him over at Thompson, I tell you that. Um, so, Okay, so I love the blues, and uh, Josh White, Bill Brunsey, uh, and so I learned, you know, with Sonny and Terry and Brownie, I went and heard them. I was still about 14 or 15. I took the MTA. My mother dropped me off at the Dedham MTA station. I'd go into Boston, and I'd go hear music at the coffee houses, and, and you did drinking age was 21 in Massachusetts. I couldn't go to bars, but if I carried my guitar, even just the case, I could pretty much walk into any coffee house and never pay cover. <laughs> That's, you know, yeah, you, oh, you can play, yeah. You, you know. It was a very cool time, really. And, and uh, I kind of wish that was still available. But it, it was a revival, you know, people like uh, Sonny Terry, Brandon McGee, and Josh White had been in New York with Woody Guthrie. And you know, the communist, uh, the witch hunt, the communist witch hunt in the McCarthy hearings brought all an end to all of that, you know? And so they got rediscovered, especially by a man named Ralph Rensler, who played mandolin with a Greenbrier voice, went on to do the Smithsonian Folklife Department Festival and bringing Cajun bluegrass and uh, all kinds of ethnic music of America into the, they had its own presentation, including the arts and crafts you know, blankets and different things that people make pottery. That was the, 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 the milieu of the people around Cambridge, Massachusetts, was uh, rediscovering the roots through uh, arts and crafts and, and music. And uh, I remember this one lady, Nancy Sweezy, who was a partner in a, a shop that, that sold, uh, you know, shawls woven in the south, in the southern mountains, and, when, and, and, and pottery. And they were partners. They had it was called a, a crossroads or something like that. And I remember Norman Kennedy from Scotland came and he sang in the store and he played in a in a coffee house, you know. And so there's this sort of a musical thing going on. And um, the reason I chose bluegrass was because again it had the harmony, you know, um, and uh, and it had you know that magic group thing. 
a lot of the blues people that I actually got to hang out with, including John Lee Hooker and wow. Sonny and Brownie and those guys, uh, they were very individualistic. Like uh, there was one, uh, the Southern Blues Summit, where they actually, I think, had a, had a drummer, and it was Lightning Hopkins, Sonny and Brownie, and Big Joe. There's, there were two, I think, I may have this wrong, there were two. Joe Williams was a blues singer, and he did like Lottie, Miss Claudia, and you know, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, all of which was coming out of the jukeboxes when I was 14. You know, you go to the grocery store and buy a 45 RPM record. So, you know, in trying to learn to sing all these songs, you know, just led, led towards a, you know, it was imitative, and, and a, but I couldn't, the, the blues, like, it was like, I couldn't do it. But I could do the bluegrass, the white version of the blues, if you follow the Monroe School, you know, and Stanley's. But Bill, the little known thing about Bill is, uh, you know, I asked one night he was on the bus, he was playing some real bluesy mandolin. And, uh, at those moments, you know, it's about two in the morning, and I, I just finished driving. You know, and, and driving that old bus, you get to the top of a hill, and uh, put it in neutral and get out of the seat and the next driver would jump in <laughs> and try and find a gear. <laughs> and so I had, we had just done that. Jimmy had taken my place and, and I went into the back of the bus. And I mean, it, these were the, the mysterious moments where people said, Bill is such a solitary guy. You know, he has a right. You know, so I would be very cool just like listen and listen and listen to what he was doing. And he'd be just, you know, you know, he'd be like. <laughs> listening to his instrument, you know. Listening to what that instrument was saying, but playing the blues. And then at one point in that actual moment, he, he, he said to me, uh, he was playing like a, you know. That, that's the Indian sound right there. I mean, this is the guy who wrote Cheyenne. Hey, 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 hey. He actually sings that stuff on the record. And I, that was my opening. If he talked to me, then I would go, well, where did you first hear the blues? You know, I mean, these are nuggets mentorship, really. He said, well, now, um, it just surprised me what he said. He said, when Lester and Earl came with me, they were so green, I took them down to New Orleans. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> I never heard that. And uh, I, he never spoke about it publicly, and I don't know why, but uh, I said, well, what, what could, kind of music could you hear down there? He said, well, a man could find any kind of music down there. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Bill, he was an adventurer. And, and I said, well, yeah, he said, flat, uh, Lester and Earl were the country boys from Tennessee, you know, or North Carolina, in Earl's case. He said, they were so, then boys were so green, I had to take them down to New Orleans and learn them the blues, you know. Well, which meant that the blues as you'd hear them in New Orleans were transformed by Bill into his approach. He was very aware of having an approach. That's my music, you would hear him say, you know. And I said, well, what, what kind of music could you say? A man could find any kind of music down there with a twinkle in his eye, you know. And, uh, and I said, you know, and I would take it further, like what, like what, you know? And he'd say, well, you had the, you had the sock time, and you had the jump time, you had the rag time, and of course, you had the slow drag. And now, I'd never heard of anything called the slow drag in my life, unless it was a slow drag on a joint and you were getting high, you know? <laughs> But so those times are like, um, 
Uh, why we, especially in the. Uh, that would be somewhere between sock time and, well, it's a bit jump time, but sock time would be even more, you know. blues that's like sock time now jump time I think is 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 a little more towards you know jump to it you know well we do mostly hear piano players and, and banjo players and all kinds of music in New Orleans uh, ragtime of course is you know variations on these things you know rag in a tune is you know you, you kind of stagger the beat a little bit delay it and This is a lick Bill taught me. The original mule skinner lick. Yeah. I don't use a flat pick much anymore, but I mean, play with my fingers as much as possible. You know, but, uh, I was loaned this beautiful piece of turqu uh, t t tortoise. Yeah. Uh, uh, I remember Tony Rice looking at one of my picks. He goes, oh, "That's all right. That's a fine piece of meat." <laughs> <laughs> So, so here's the, the real, this is what Bill taught me, this is the Mule Skinner. So, it, it's finger picking, it would be, you know, Good morning, Captain. Good morning, Shine. And that kind of is sort of lost now in bluegrass. That where each tune would have a signature. Uh, so that would be the jump time, I, I think. And I think it was Arnold Schultz that probably did the finger picking that they got built into the articulating the notes that way. But uh, he, he was also dealing with people that were steeped in, you know, the folk music of the Southern Mountains and square dances, everybody had been or played at square dances. But the slow drag, I said, you know, the slow drag has got to be something like, you know, in the pines, in the pines, you know, because it's not, you know, the pine, in the pine, where the sun shines, you know, it's slow, and all this kind of hammering on, it, it shouldn't be lost, you know. as an aside to that, you know, this lick, basically it's this. One kind favor I'll ask of you. One kind favor I'll ask of you. Six White Horses came from, uh, you know, made it into a love, you know, a song about man and woman, but originally it was done by a man called Blind Lemon Jefferson, who taught Lightning Hopkins. So suddenly I had made the full circle, this was only a few years ago that I actually found it on the internet. I just, where does that lick come from? Because everybody plays a version of it. Earl Scruggs, right? Let the church roll on, let the church roll on, oh my Lord, let the 
church roll on. So, <clears throat> connecting the blues and bluegrass has sort of been my journey in terms of singing. Um, I guess I've experienced enough pain and torture in my life to actually sing a blues and feel like I was actually singing a song, not imitating. Uh, you know, and uh, but Mule Skinner Blues, I mean, come on, that's a blues right there. And most of Bill's music, you know, in the blues, of course, came from the black culture around him in the South. So you're... So I did teach my brother some of these songs. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I already forgot about that. <laughs> Thanks for the guitar lesson, that was fabulous. <laughs> so you're up there in New England. And Bill is down in Kentucky. Yeah. The and Bill then Link work. is Joe Val. Joe Val. Joe Valiente. Okay. Joseph Valiente. How'd that happen? Do you all know about Joe Val? Yeah. Yeah. No. Let's have a brilliant for Joe Val. <laughs> so as I got to hang out more on the, I met a guy named Jim Rooney and Bill Keith. And for a moment, uh, uh, well, actually, Joe was on their record that they did. Uh, it's an unbelievable story. But uh, they did a record for, it was a, a major label at the time, and they were looking for folk music. And it was Keith and Rooney with Joe Val. And I think Herb Applin played a little fiddle on it. It was hard to find a fiddle player up in New England. Most of them played Canadian style. Uh, the Bluegrass Longbow. Uh, you know, where it's dead or didn't, did, 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 you know, that's a transition. And uh, when people, most fiddle players could make it into that, but uh, there were a lot of French Canadian fiddlers in Massachusetts that, you know, they play French Canadian music and that was, that's what they did. And they were fabulous. And mandolin, uh, so, but, okay, the producer of that Keith and Rooney and Joe Val record was a man named Paul Rothschild. Now, Paul Rothschild went to the Bahamas with Earth Operas, my, David Grissom and my first band, Peter Siegel and Paul Rothschild went to the Caribbean and found a guy named Joseph Spence. So now Joseph is, <laughs> you know, he's a whole other thing in, in this like really rhythmic guitar playing, you know, um, Adam the, um, Rolling sea, Jesus, come to me. Out on the rolling sea, Jesus, come. Out on the rolling sea, Jesus, come to me. Oh, Jesus, come to me out on the rolling sea. That's a poor imitation of Joseph Spence. But it was un uncanny music. And so we're just in bluegrass. And Peter Siegel's been to the Caribbean and he's recorded this guy with another guy, Paul Rothschild. Does anybody know who Paul Rothschild was? He ended up producing a very popular band called The Doors. <laughs> and Earth Opera had the strange karmic fate of being the opening act for The Doors in, in places like theaters in the round. You know, and and, and I, I must say, I was impressionable enough to pick up on some of, you know, uh, Jim's. Uh, I mean, he, he was, his whole thing was unpredictability. You know, he, he, I forgot this till somebody recently just played me a live show. He come out on the stage and everybody's like, oh, you know, totally the charisma. They're all probably higher than kites, you know. You know, 16 year old Long Island people taking acid for the first time. <sighs> Going to see the doors, you know. And uh, the first thing he do is he come out there and, and he kind of caress the microphone. And everybody would go, ah. everything was quiet. And he'd go, wake up! <laughs> he'd scream, wake up! And then the doors, da, 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 da. you know, it was, and his whole thing was anticipating with a crowd. You know, I mean, he had it down. And